Hello. Hello. Is this Ricky Lee Jones? Yeah, it is. Hi, Ricky. This is Kamasami Kong calling you from Osaka. Hello, Mr. Kong. How are you? I'm doing fine. (laughs) Thank you. Where are we catching you right now? I am in uh, New Orleans in my home. In my little house. I thought you were from Los Angeles. No, actually, I think you were born in Illinois, and then you moved out west to Arizona, then California, and now New Orleans. That's right. That's right. Is that Uh right? I moved here about five years ago. I had enough of California, at least living there. And uh, I love it here. It's really wonderful. Why do you love it there? Well, first of all, it's cheap enough to live Uh because California is really expensive. Right. And there's a way that the people are that is not like anywhere else, at least in America, where you walk down the street, everybody that looks at you will say hello or look you in the eye and acknowledge your existence, which never happens in Los Angeles. And I like it because people are courteous and it's New Orleans especially is full of music everywhere. It's got this exotic tropical smell of the deterioration of leaves and things that's always make that kind of dank smell that I really like. Mm -hmm. And for America, there's some of the oldest architecture that's also about to fall down, but it's pretty wonderful, really. It's, It's got tradition and the Westerners, which I am, we don't have much tradition out there, so it's appealing to me. Well, it sounds like you found your paradise. Well, for now, yes, I have. <laughs> I do live right next to the railroad track, so oh. when that train goes by, it is loud. <laughs> but other than that, it's pretty great. Hopefully the train will go by while we're talking. Well, Ricky, when you're in town and when you're out about in town in New Orleans, do you ever jam with any of the fantastic bands that are there? Well, I I don't go out and play with them much, but they come over and play with me. Oh. Yes, a few of them. Uh-huh. I have a new record coming out, so I got to, it was all produced and recorded here. I got to meet a lot of the local talent, and there's a lot of it. It's it's a lot of brass players, of course, but singer songwriters, trad jazz really creative, interesting women doing unusual work here. It's a it's a good time to live here. Much more interesting than the 80s when I lived here before. I want to ask you more about your new album in just a moment. But yeah, first, I've, I've got to say what a pleasure it is to be talking to you, Ricky Lee Jones. I can't believe that we're having a conversation here. I'm going to say a few things and please make comments along the way. You're coming to Japan for concerts in Tokyo and to visit us here in Osaka, among other places. Yes. What are your thoughts two about shows. two yeah. shows? What are your thoughts about coming to Japan? Well, I'm excited, and uh, it's been many years since I played theater there. Mm-hmm. I uh, think th- that these shows will be the first shows for the new record. Mm-hmm. I love coming there, so. My thoughts are, I'm excited. (laughs) You're excited. Well, your fans here are very excited, too. I've got to tell you that. Now, folks, you've got to know. Let me just say a few things here about you. You've been nominated for multiple Grammy Awards at the 22nd Annual Grammy Awards Ceremony. Yeah. Let's see. You were nominated for Song of the Year, Best Pop Vocal Performance, Best Rock Vocal Performance for Last Chance Texaco. Uh Uh-huh. And you got the award for Best New Artist. That's right. Congratulations on that. <laughs> that was one. Thank the, you. Where do you keep the Grammy? Well, I am sorry to say that Grammy broke a oh. long time ago. I have what's left of it here, oh. but the nameplate fell off and the, the, the horn thing broke off. Oh, I have a little sad little broken Grammy. I, I could get another one, I guess. I Actually, I, I have two of them because I got one uh, some years later for a duet with Dr. John. But I don't know where the Grammys are, I, I have to tell you. Of course, <laughs> of course I'm going to ask you about Mac Rebenack a little bit later. You just mentioned Dr. John. Yeah. 
a longtime friend of mine. Is that right? Uh-huh. We can talk about him a little bit later, but I want to ask you about your new album. Of course, we all know okay. you created the song Chucky's In Love. And this morning, before I called you, I put a note on Facebook uh, asking my friends to provide a question if they had any question they would want me to ask you. And one of the most asked questions, I guess, which you get all the time is, who is Chucky and is he still in love? (laughs) Can you answer that? Well, uh, Chucky is... Uh, the the guy who inspired this song, because it could be any Chuck, really, but is Chuck E. Weiss, who was a sidekick of Tom Waits back in the late 70s when I knew them. And uh, the reason I spelled Chucky with an E instead of Chucky, which is the traditional way, right. was just because I thought it was cute. And that, you know, it was a good song, but when people saw how it was spelled, they go, oh, and so I was, I like to mention that one of the things about Chucky is the E kind of started a trend in the 80s of Mm. people calling themselves initial, you know, a a name with an initial instead of that traditional Y and I E. I don't know why I've been thinking about that lately. I think that came and went, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But that was, Chucky is probably not still in love. <laughs> I'm afraid he's no longer in love. Who was he in love with? Can you reveal that? Again, at the time when he was talking about being in love, he, he, he said he, he said he'd just seen his cousin. She's so beautiful. Oh, my God, I'm in love. And at the time, uh, it seemed pretty innocent to me. And I reported it to the press, which got Chuck in a lot of trouble with his family. But it was just an innocent remark he made. He, he was in love with his cousin. Don't you know Chuck is in love? Your picture has been on the cover of Rolling Stone, on the cover of Time twice. Magazine twice. Yeah. How did you feel <laughs> when you were in the bookstore or, or at the magazine stand and you saw your pictures on the cover of those two iconic magazines? I felt so important. <laughs> I felt important. Well, you I are tried important. To act well, like I didn't notice it. You know, I just go over and stand by the magazine and see if anybody notices you're, st- you're the guy <laughs> on the cover. La, 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 la. Um, but I think that it felt pretty. The first time, there was so much happening in my life that it was thrilling, but mm-hmm. it was part of so much that was going on. And then the second time, was to launch the record Pirates, mm-hmm. and um, that was a totally different time in my life. But they, they were they were both pretty, you know. It was I felt honored and happy. Well, apparently you were noticed by Francis Ford Coppola, but because it seems he he offered you a part in a movie, or he wanted to collaborate with you on a movie project. What's the story there? Yes, he did. He, well. He was making a film called One from the Heart, Mm -hmm. and he had sent me the script and asked if I was interested in writing music for it. I came to his studio, a beautiful new studio, and he said that he wanted me to write this music with Tom Waits, who had been my former boyfriend, and I wasn't comfortable um, getting together with him to work on music at that time. So that's what happened with that opportunity. I see. Any regrets about that opportunity? Ah, you know, a little bit. <laughs> I shouldn't really have a regret because it, it wouldn't have been possible. It, it was too, still too emotional and raw. But I wish, you know, I mean, he was ready to do it. So <laughs> and he and he got, you know, he got his foot in in movies uh, because of it. So, yes, it was a, I regret not getting my foot in the movie, but I don't regret not doing that music, no. 
But anyway, your music has shown up in various television shows and movies, a lot of different. I, I checked you out in Wikipedia, and your music is everywhere. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> it's in the Jerry McGuire, which plays a lot over here, and they and that's pretty cool to see it. And, but it is, and we did we did finally license it to a number of TV shows and movies. Yeah. I've got kind of an off the wall question for you this time. Sure. What does the song, The Moon is Made of Gold, mean to you? Well, my father wrote that song the year I was born. And and he made a, he and my uncle made a record. You know, they used to have these little booths. You could go make a record at the bus station or the train sure. station, go yes. home with the record. And so I grew up with hearing this record of my father singing. And I think it had a big impact. It was so thrilling to hear his voice. And I definitely wanted to make a record, too. The song is so romantic and for little children, about little children, and about believing in magic. Um, so so I'm lucky to have had a dad like that, and, and somebody who would write a song like that as a grown-up, you know. It says, one by one, your dreams will all come true. Magic, you'll behold. The night is magic, and the moon is made of gold. I can still sing it, you know, and also he is a kind of jazzy, 40s kind of jazz tune so it's also how I learned to sing because mm. father had a little bit of Mills Brothers and a little bit of Frank Sinatra in oh, his voice and wow. he always sang a little bit behind the beat this deep resonating voice and uh, that was that was how I learned to sing initially from my dad. Have you ever thought about covering his song? Because I know you've done covers of a few other songs, including Sympathy for the Devil. But have you ever thought about yeah. doing a cover of The Moon is Made of Gold? That's a good idea. <laughs> I actually haven't thought of doing it, though. No. Well, maybe you can it's a great idea. do that for the first time for your fans here in Japan. Maybe I can. You know, That's a great idea. You know, things happen when you come to Japan. <laughs> yes, they do. When you come to Japan, outside of performing for your fans, what would you like to do while you're here? I'm actually going to come two days early, maybe four or five days before the show. I've actually come to Japan for vacations before. Mm -hmm. I came and stayed in a traditional um, Japanese motel, hotel, which Ryokan. starts with an R. Yeah, Ryokan. Yes, I did sleep on the floor. Oh. And did the on New Year's Day had an incredible meal of things that I, I don't even know what they were, but it was, but I, I got a little bit of a taste for a stoic and quiet vacation. So I was going to inquire about possibly going up north to a Buddhist kind of retreat. Mm -hmm. Maybe a temple. So, uh, anyway, I'm like coming that. early. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to actually, maybe I'll ask you, but I'm going to see if I can find out if there are places to go just for a couple of days. I'm sure your record company or the fine folks at Kyoto can point you in the right direction. That they will. <laughs> Hopefully, that period of being alone here in Japan might be inspirational for you to write a song about this place. Wouldn't that? Yeah, I've spent a bit of time in Osaka. That's where I stayed in, in the, uh, the New Year's, which was... Must have been 20 years ago, but that's where I stayed, so I really love it there. You've worked with a virtual who's who of people in the world of show business, music business. You've worked with Walter Becker. You were making whoopee with Dr. John, as I remember, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so now let's play a little name game. I'm going to throw out the names of some people, and I just want you... Ricky Lee Jones to make a comment, just a short comment about the person's name that I throw out. There are no wrong answers, oh. <laughs> no right answers, just Ricky Lee Jones answers. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Laura Nero. Oh, my favorite, most inspirational female singer in my life. Yeah. Bob Dylan. Probably the most important folk rock writer of America ever. Genius. Michael McDonald. What a singer, and what blue eyes he has. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Jagger. 
My my big sister looked like Mick Jagger. That's about all I can say. What part? The eyes, the nose, or the lips? The mouth, the face. Yeah, and she also had the kind of got kind of thin and looked like him that way too. <laughs> peg leg. Ah, uh, peg leg Jones, my grandfather, a vaudevillian. Yeah, so- uh, who, who is a one legged dancer. You have show business in your blood. Yes, I do. Walter Becker. The other half of Steely Dan had a producer for Flying Cowboys and, and, a, and a friend till he passed away a year or two ago. Dr. John. Lives here in the same town as me. One of the first people to check me out before I got a record label. One of the first people uh, that that came and played music with me to see what they thought and still a friend. Did Dr. John invite you over to his house for some, maybe some of that <laughs> car wan soup, car wan soup or some of that gree gree gumbo. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, he came <laughs> over to my father's house for some gumbo and gree gree, but uh, that's right. He's one of a kind. Yes, he is. Lyle Lovett. Ah, I took him on tour in 1989, he opened for me on the Flying Cowboy Tour, and uh, it was really great for his career. It was really fun working with him. Okay, Robin Williams. An old friend. We used to hang out in 1981 in San Francisco, I think, or 80, and walk around the city together, go to comedy clubs. It's a friend. Chucky Weiss. Yeah. Chucky Weiss. I guess kind of a touchstone, huh? Yeah. Just a friend, but ended up being such an important friend after all. And one last name. Ricky Lee Jones. (laughs) That woman just goes on and on. (laughs) All right. One more thing before we go, and that is consider us all your children. And if you wanted to teach us a life lesson, some life lesson, what would you want that life lesson to be? Here's a, here's a lesson that might end up in how you saw your life. But the lesson I've learned in performing is that some, some people come to the show, the artists come to the show, hoping to get the audience to love them. But the audience does love you. Your job is to show them that you love them. Mm. They've come for you to love them. And that simple thing, learning that and knowing it, stepping onto the stage with your heart full of love, is the key to happiness, I think, for a performer. Otherwise, you're up there going, did they like me? Did they like me? Did Mm. they like me? But it's better to give them love. What a great lesson. Thank you very much for that. Do you have any message for your friends and fans here in Japan, especially in Osaka? Well, I think it's a great time to see me. I'm feeling pretty good about life and happy to to be working. And I feel like I know just who I am when I'm on stage anyway. So I'm really looking forward to as many people who know my name showing up to hear the music. I hope that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good to know that you're still performing, still writing, and you're still having dreams and writing songs about your dreams. That's right. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking time to be with us here on FM Kokolo. We're looking very forward to seeing you very soon here in our city. (laughs) And have a safe and relaxing flight. Thank you, Kamasami Kong. Thank you, Kamasami Kong. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> Poor Ricky. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <Right> so hard. <laughs> Ricky Lee Thank Jones. you, dear. Truly a pleasure. <laughs> we'll see ya. Thank you, Kong.